Since the dawn of time, wild foods have been essential to our survival. For hundreds of thousands of years, our bodies have evolved to integrate the vast array of vitamins, minerals, and nutrients these wild foods provide. At the dawn of civilization, we began domesticating, cultivating, and selectively breeding these foods to maximize yields and harness their potential. It's only recently, with the advent of industrial agriculture and the introduction of chemicals to our food system, that we have begun to divorce ourselves from nature, much to the detriment of our health, our environment, and our way of life. My name is Kevin Chapp, and for me, wild foods aren't just a luxury, they're a way of life. As an environmentalist, educator, and professional forager, I know the best ingredients are still waiting to be discovered. You just need to know where to look. Today, I'm exploring the indigenous food systems of Vermont with some of my friends from the Abnaki community, the traditional stewards of this land, to learn how we might bring ourselves and our food system back into alignment with nature and heal some of the most pressing environmental issues of our time. This is John Hunt, Abnaki member and native skills instructor, who is taking us deep into the woods to explore the concept of the forest garden and how this philosophy may provide a roadmap for improving our food system and our personal relationship with nature. When we're living in sync with nature, it really brings us back into health, healthy mind and body. You know, nowadays we've got so much technology, but that can really, in the long run, be pretty harmful for our bodies and for our psychology. We've been so interconnected to nature, and it's only within the last 100 or 200 years that we've really started divorcing ourselves from this, right? Yeah, definitely. Now we have to make an effort, but it's, it's worth the effort. It's important to make the effort. Whoa. Oh, hey. The base, too. Beautiful. Yeah, that's a nice looking maitake there. What a perfect example of the prolificness of nature, right? Yeah, yeah, these old trees and the mycelium's probably helping them out. And then they're just producing so much food. So John, can you talk to us a little bit about the concept of the forest garden? Yeah, I mean, the forest garden is, it's a way of being in relationship with the land that promotes food for, for us and for, for the animals, for all the life. The earth just like is growing in a, in a wild way. It's just producing as much as it can. It's sort of a belief that the human can be a steward. The human can actually have a positive impact and increase the abundance of uh, food. That nature produces all on its own, right? Right, yeah. Nature's gonna do it on its own, but if, if we put our hands in with a conscious mind, an understanding mind, we can even make it more rich. Sometimes like we got the story like that we left Eden, but the Abenaki people never left Eden. And uh, we've just been in this place, cultivating this place. It's not really like it used to be. You know, the land's definitely been changed a lot, but the trees are still around. The potential is still here and we're doing it. We're bringing it back in different places. I just think it's amazing to think when Europeans landed here, they couldn't see all the cultivation that had happened for tens of thousands of years. That's really allowing nature to do what it does best. The sophistication of the, the agriculture system was so high that people couldn't see it at all. And it just seemed like abundant wild lands. But really they were so abundant because of our deep connection and long-term stewardship of them. When we talk about wild foods, we're talking about rewilding our food system, bringing it back into alignment with nature. The concept of the forest garden that John has just outlined is a central theme in many indigenous cultures and can show us how to become better stewards of the environment in which we all grow. There's such abundance to be found in nature when we move into closer alignment with it. Armed with this new information, I travel north to Sterling College to meet with Tiana Baca, professor of sustainable food systems and faculty head of the Donland Gardens a new program in partnership with the Abnaki people to reintroduce native crops back into our food system. Tiana is helping to unpack indigenous approaches to agriculture and how the Abnaki maximized yields in a system of companion planting known as the Three Sisters. Are you going to seed bank these or are you going to use these for food or what? Yeah, so this particular variety, these are speckled Algonquian beans um, and these are seeds that are being grown specifically for the Seeds of Renewal project. 
So we are in the Domland Heritage Garden and this garden is a beautiful like mound um, and Three Sisters Milpa plot. And we are growing Abenaki varieties to share back with the Seeds of Renewal project. So Sterling is kind of this intermediary steward that is yeah, supporting these bigger endeavors. Can you talk a little bit about what Three Sisters is? Yeah, so the Three Sisters is a companion planting group of corn, beans, and squash. They're plants that grow together and support each other. So the corn is growing up, it's providing this living trellis. The beans use that to climb on. The beans are then fixing nitrogen and supporting the growth of the corn and then the squash plant kind of sprawls out and provides this living mulch. So all of them working together makes all of them produce better. These crops haven't been widely distributed for quite some time, but these would have been prolific several hundred years ago. Is that right? Right, yeah. So these are very old traditional crops that have been lost in number. As folks came in, like traditional foods were displaced, but it's a process of refinding them. And so uh, there may only be a handful of seeds that we start with. And so by planting them out, even in just a plot like this size, um, over one season, we're able to double, quadruple the amount of seed that was there. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Can you tell me why that's important? Yeah, so there's so much um, of what we're growing here and how we're growing it, right? We're taking cues from what's actually happening around us, right? So nature doesn't grow in monocrops. It's polyculture, it's diversity. And so using that as a model just in this space, right? We're, we're building on those collaborations. As we're, we're thinking about agroecology and it's, it's science and these principles of ecology, but it's also very much this integration of social and this broader community. And so being in this space, like we are growing and we are very much thinking about the biodiversity and the genes, the genetic integrity of these plants, but we're also thinking about the relationships to people and place. So we're not just having a huge field of this particular corn, right. but they are being cultivated in traditional fashion, right, in this mound system together. And that is supporting the plants, but it's also supporting community and, and tradition and history and heritage. Agroforestry and the rediscovery of indigenous crops are an integral part of how we reinvent our food system. Part of that rediscovery is learning how to eat and prepare these foods as well. My friend and Abenaki chef, Jesse Lawyer, is helping in this effort by preparing a traditional meal from the crops we've just seen, while I discuss how wild foods played such an important role in indigenous communities with Chief Don Stevens, tribal elder of the Nulhagen Band of the Kusik Abenaki. When the Europeans came, they came to this land and they saw a forest that probably was fairly groomed. So they say, wow, I'm going to move in, not knowing that native people are nomadic and they create agroforestry so that way we don't use up all the resources and we promote it. When we look at things, we look at things like how do we be stewards of the land where a lot of times Europeans adopted the mindset of being dominion over. So how can you own something that you share with other living things like trees, animals, and ourselves? Yeah. And I think if people got away and started looking more at the connection to the source, whether it be their food sources, whether it be their, the land or the animals or other sources, I think we'd be in much better shape to save this planet for our future. If you think about the history of Vermont, that this was deforested. I mean, there wasn't a lot of forest left at one point. And then Vermont switched and now we're mostly forested, right? So there is hope. There is a way to reconnect and change the outcomes of what is happening. But the only way to do that is to put the effort, time and resources into connecting with us, native people and others, to try to remember that historical knowledge of connection to our land, our animals, and our wild food sources. Yep. The forests and the wild foods sustained our people for thousands of years. Why would we not think it wouldn't do that now? I think we're gonna enjoy a little food here. Yeah, I'm hey, looking Jess. forward to Let's it. Let's go, and How's here we go. A little Thanks. food. Hello, Wendy, Nidamba. Thank you, friend. Welcome. This looks amazing. So what are we eating, Jesse? So a little seasonal stew, three sisters style, 
all three sisters are in here. We have uh, mousse cooked down with carrots, onions, sunchokes, squash, vegetable broth thickened with bean flour. Uh, bean flour came from Vermont bean crafters for the Abenaki people. Then we have some East Montpelier squash, also some fiddleheads and finished with little fiddlehead dust, dried fiddlehead dust. This is a fairly local dish. Completely local, you don't get any more local than this. Amazing. Oh wow, mm. yeah, this is fantastic. And everything on this dish at the center of the plate is indigenous. So all of the main ingredients, the corn, bean, squash, the mousse, the sunchokes, they're all indigenous. They're all local to this area. And in order to have a conversation about the push for local and sustainable foods, you can't have that conversation without indigenous foods. So that's kind of my focus with cooking is engaging our Abenaki community to want to cook more and explore these ingredients more. So not only are you exploring your craft, but you're also exploring your heritage. Exactly. Through the work. Exactly. I can't thank you both enough for taking part in this. And uh, I'm looking forward to digging back in and finishing up this stew here, so. Thank you, Willem and And thank you, Jesse, for making this for us today. Yeah, you're welcome. You so thank, you, thank you, ancestors and uh, Mother Earth for providing the food for us. We always gotta remember to thank where we get these things from. That is an important acknowledgement in our culture that we have to acknowledge that this is not given to us alone. This is a gift that we must be thankful for and to share. Native traditions hold vital information for transforming our food system and returning balance to our relationship with nature. For thousands of years, wild foods sustain these people and can now provide a bridge to our agricultural and environmental roots. Perhaps it isn't just time to offer them a seat at our table, but ask for a seat at theirs, because everything we need can be found in the wild. We just need to know where to look.